So uncertainty and uncertainty propagation. Wh why is it part of, of, the, of the course? Uh, why pay attention to uncertainty? Well, our course is about global soil information facilities, about digital soil mapping, among others. And maybe you've heard about this initiative, the globalsoilmap.net project. So it's like a big project. Uh, nowadays, we also have the Global Soil Partnership having sort of the same aim. So we want to make digital soil maps of the whole world at fine resolution of many soil properties at multiple depths. That's like the ambition of this worldwide consortium. And one of the things that they want is they want to make maps that not only make maps of soil properties, but also quantify the uncertainty associated with these maps. So it's not enough to just make a map and to predict, for example, the clay content or the organic matter or, or any soil property, but you also want to know how accurate is that prediction. And the idea of the Global Soil Map.net project is to quantify these uncertainties, the accuracies, with uh, prediction intervals, the 90% prediction interval, the lower and the upper limit at any location for any soil property at any depth. And why, why would that be important? Well, I think that uh, we are researchers, we, we, we produce maps, <laughs> And I think any, well, I put here, any self-respecting researcher should not be just satisfied with making a map, but you also want to know how good is my map, how accurate is my map. Is my map accurate enough, actually, to be presented to my client, uh, to my user? So you don't want to make a map public before you have some guarantee, some information about the quality of that map. Another nice thing about being able to quantify the uncertainty in maps uh, maps we can produce with various methods. Uh, we, we looked at ordinary krieging on Monday, we looked at regression krieging. What we did on Monday was regression krieging with a linear regression model. Yesterday you learned about uh, random forests, all kind of machine learning techniques, so non-linear type of regressions. So there's various methods that we can make maps. Which method is best? Well, that depends on how accurate such a method is. So if we can quantify the accuracy of maps that allows us also to evaluate how well a method compares to another method. It gives us a, a tool to compare methods. And our end users, that's the third bullet over here, our clients, uh, they probably will want to know how accurate any map, any product that we produce, that we give them, is to them because they need to, they, they don't want the map just as it is, they want to, they need it for a certain purpose and they have a certain use in mind. So in terms of their, the use that they have in mind for, for that map, they need to know how accurate is the map. Is the map accurate enough for the intended use? So this is about the usability of maps. Uh, another important aspect, what is an advantage of being able to quantify the accuracy of the maps that we produce, is that it allows us to analyze how uncertainty propagates through environmental models, through spatial analysis. Like I said, the, the map that we produce usually is not the end product, but it's like an input to some kind of analysis of a user or a colleague of ours who is doing, for example, erosion modeling or hydrologic groundwater flow modeling or crop growth modeling. They need soil information as input. If the soil input information is not perfect, is not completely uh, accu accurate, there is a limited accuracy, there's some uncertainty about it, then that uncertainty will propagate. So if we want to trace how the uncertainty propagates through such a model, such an analysis, the first thing we need, of course, is to know how accurate is then that input, how accurate is that soil map. And that is important because the, the quality and uh, the accuracy of the end product of such an analysis, I mean that end product is going to be used in decision making, in policy making. And if the, accu the accuracy is really poor, then the decision maker might take a wrong decision about, for example, about how to manage the land. And you don't want to uh, take uh, wrong decisions because that could have really costly consequences. So it's important that we are able to quantify the accuracy of maps and also of end products of a, of a, of a, of a spatial model. Now, uh, I think there was a question on Monday also about comparing the, the Krieging standard deviation map with uh, the validation statistics. 
So that's addressed over here. So if we would have independent validation data, we could just compare, like we did on, on Monday, uh, like com computing the mean error or the root mean squared error, compare the predicted soil property with the independent measured soil property, and we could look at the differences and we could calculate the root mean squared error. That would give us a, like a summary statistic of how well, how accurate is this map. But it is not spatially explicit. That's also what I said on Monday. Maybe you remember that. So if you want to have spatially explicit uncertainties, how accurate is the map over here? How accurate is it over there? Then we need to do it in a different way. Well, we can use this, for example, this, this Krieging techniques, which help us, which also quantify the uncertainty in the map. Okay. So what are we going to do uh, today, uh, this morning? We're going to, well, maybe first we should take, like, take a little bit of a step back. So what is error? What is uncertainty? Uh, are they the same? Are they different? So let, let's think about that a little bit. And then we're going to look at how can we model uncertainty statistically with probability distributions. And a lot of the things that we'll be talk talking about this morning is a little bit already covered on Monday, but we're going to repeat that in a little bit different way. And we're going to extend our statistical model of uncertainty to spatially distributed variables. And finally, and maybe this is the biggest part of this morning, we're going to analyze, to look at how do uncertainties in inputs to spatial models, like soil property maps, propagate through these models. And as before, like we also did on Monday in the computer practical, after the coffee break, we're going to uh, apply the above <laughs> to a real world case study. We're going to use, actually we're going to use the same data set that we used on Monday, but we are going to analyze how the uncertainty in, you remember you made a map of the lead concentration of the soil. The, there was an uncertainty there because we had an interpolation error. We're going to analyze how the uncertainty in that soil lead concentration map propagates through a very simple model. But I'll explain that uh, toward the end of the lecture. So that's, that's the plan for this morning, okay? Well, just introducing error, uh, I, I showed you maps of the pH of the soil of Europe. This is another map of the organic carbon content that we produced some time ago. So uh, yeah, is this map error free? Is this the organic carbon content of the A horizon? Well, I think uh, that would be... Uh, <laughs> Like in, a, an, uh, in an ideal world, it would be error-free, but I think we all agree that it is not error-free. Uh, if, if we would check at any location whether the predicted value agrees with the true value that we could measure, that for sure we would find differences. And one of the main reasons is that, well, there are measurement errors, there are interpretation errors when somebody measures something and does a field interpretation, Maybe there could even be typing errors. It happens once in a while. Uh, digitization errors. I'm not sure if that is an important source in this case. Classification errors. If we look, for example, at, at soil, soil type or land cover, land, land use. So if we look at categorical data, then often we will get classification errors. Maybe if you're familiar with remote sensing, you will know huh? we, we classify the land use, the land cover from remote sensing imagery. Then there will be classification errors. Uh, of course, in cartography, we also make generalization errors when we smooth bo boundaries. And for us, really important are also interpolation errors. Because in this example, well, you remember we had for the pH, we had these 2,580 observations. Well, for organic carbon, we have a similar amount, maybe a bit less, because we don't have, for example, you maybe remember from Monday in Sweden, we had a lot of data on the pH, but apparently we didn't have a lot of data on the organic carbon content of the A horizon. So fewer data. Uh, it we create a map by spatial interpolation, and you might think, oh, we have a lot of observations, so not so bad. But if you look at the scale, if you check, uh, you know, Spain, really big country, and maybe we have only uh, 100, 200 observations, so for sure, the interpolation error will be very large. And we quantify that also with our Kriegen. So definitely there will be errors in, in this map, mainly the interpolation error. 
Okay, so uh, what, what is error, right? Uh, and what is uncertainty? Let, let's just uh, take a step back and think about that for a minute. Well, I think an error is the very simple definition of an error is it's the difference between the reality and our representation of reality. Okay, so we have something in our head, an estimate, a prediction, some representative value, but that will deviate from the true value. And the difference between the truth and our representation, that would be the error. Uh, for example, suppose this, this map that I just showed you said that at some location the organic carbon content is 35 gram per kilogram. Now we go to that location, we measure the true organic carbon content and we find that it's actually 57. Well then we all agree, I hope, that the error is simply the difference between those two values would be 22 gram per kilogram. Another example would be like the number of people in this building. Uh, let's take the Lumen building over here. Uh, well, we could make an estimate of that. Let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, 250. But we could also count how many are there truly in this building. And we might find that there are 280. So then our error in our estimate would be 30. So error is just the difference between the true value and the real value. Yet another example would be, what will be the maximum temperature in Wageningen tomorrow? I can ask you, uh, well, I, 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 I explored it a little bit. I looked at the weather forecast and my, my guess based on that information now is that it's 16 degrees. And actually there's a website that makes these predictions. So. Uh, look, today, Wednesday, tomorrow, Thursday, the prediction of the maximum temperature tomorrow is like 16 degrees. But uh, there is a little bit of a band, right? Uh, some, well, that's a bit to do with the uncertainty that we're going to talk about in the middle, as, uh, in a minute. And so you also see that as we predict far further ahead in the future, the uncertainty becomes larger. So the error in the prediction will be larger. So the good news is that the temperature is increasing towards uh, the end of the week. <laughs> okay. Okay. How to, how to calculate uh, this, this, this confidence interval, that is going to be discussed also later today. So also if we make, uh, these are all examples of, you can make a prediction, you can have an estimate, you can have a representative, your guess of what the true value is, but the true value itself might well differ from your guess, from your estimate, and the difference between the two, that would be the error. Well, that's all very nice. We can define the error, but in practice, we usually do not know it. I if I would know that the error in the organic carbon prediction is 22 gram per kilogram, I would immediately correct my representation for that error. So we know that there is an error, but we don't know how big the error is or what the exact value of the error is. And that's where the uncertainty comes in. So in many cases, we, 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 or we never know the exact value of the error because if we would know it, we would correct for it. But it doesn't mean that we, have, that we are completely ignorant. Uh, we, will know, we will know something. For example, if we used, like we do in Krieging, when we, it, we, we discussed that on Monday, it's an unbiased interpolation technique. Yeah? Remember that there is no systematic error involved because the sum of the Krieging weights was one. Maybe you remember that from Monday. So that means that we, have, we know that there's a 50% chance that the error is positive and a 50% chance that the error is negative. Um, we may also know that the, the magnitude of the error has a certain maximum value or that certain big values are very unlikely, right? So we might know that it's unlikely that the error is bigger than, than 25, for example. Very unlikely. That happens only once out of uh, 100 times, things like that. Okay. So uh, we might use this blue band that I showed you in the previous slide. Th this is actually quantifying the, the kind of the, the size, the magnitude of the errors that, that may occur. So uh, error, we don't know the true value of the error, but we do know 
something about it, how big it usually can be, uh, that there uh, is uh, some sort of limit, that it is symmetric around zero and so on. So we have an idea about the error, but we cannot give one specific number to it. So basically, uh, it, it means that we are uncertain about the reality. Um, we don't know the true reality, but we do have an idea. We are not completely ignorant. Okay, so we defined what is error. So what, what about uncertainty? Um, they are related, error and uncertainty, but they're not really the same. At least not in, in my view. <laughs> uncertainty is something that belongs to people. People are uncertain. I am uncertain about the number of people that are in this building. And that is because I have limited information. Uh, I, if I would have perfect information, I would have no uncertainty, I would be certain about the thing that I'm interested in, and there would also be no error in my estimate. So when there is limited information, we are uncertain and we acknowledge that our representation of reality, our estimate, might be in error. That's the link between the two. So you could say that uncertainty is an acknowledgement of error. You are aware that your representation of reality is not perfect. You acknowledge it. Right. <laughs> so uncertainty is also subjective. One person can be more uncertain than another person simply because the one person has less information than the other person. Uh, I usually I, I give the example of uh, my age. Uh, how old am I? Well, I know it very well, so uh, I'm not uncertain about that, but you are uncertain. And uh, maybe there are some people in this room who know me a little bit better, so they have a l smaller uncertainty than others who, who see me now uh, this week for the first time. Okay, so, and that's perfectly all right. So uncertainty does not necessarily have to be something objective that everybody agrees on. It can be subjective because it depends on the amount of information that you have available. Now, when we talk about, for example, throwing the dice, uh, and I don't, I, I suppose I throw a die and I don't show you the outcome, you are uncertain about the outcome, and probably you all agree about how uncertain it is because you think it's a fair die, one probability, one out of six to all the, the six possible outcomes. So then everybody agrees, then there is no subjectivity. And I think also the things we did on Monday when we predicted the, the soil pH in Europe, we used Krieging, we all got more or less the same standard deviation maps. So there we agreed, even though some people might have used a little bit different variogram. And so then also the Krieging standard deviation map will be a little bit different. So there is already some subjectivity there. Yeah. Okay. So, if we are uncertain about the reality, it simply means that we cannot identify one single true reality. We know it is there, it is out there in the field, there is, uh, the pH of the soil has a certain value, we just don't know it. But it doesn't mean that we're completely ignorant, we can make a prediction, we can hopefully quantify how accurate our prediction is, and that, that's what uncertainty is about. So we do not have the ability to give one true single outcome. Perhaps we can list all possible outcomes and attach a probability to these. And if we would be able to do that, then we start quantifying our uncertainty with a probability distribution. So it's like a statistical model of uncertainty that we are going to present. <coughs> I have an, uh, another example of that. Let's say, okay, again the temperature in Wageningen, but now, well, more than five years from now. Okay, August the 1st, 2020. That's in the future. <coughs> we don't know what the temperature will be in Wageningen on that day. Okay, we can wait five, a bit more than five years and we will know, but until that time we are uncertain about it. But it doesn't mean we are completely ignorant, we have climate records, we, uh, maybe we should take climate change a little bit into account, I don't know, but uh, then we should probably should be able to come up with a list of possible outcomes for the maximum temperature in Wageningen on that date, and maybe also list, uh, attach a probability to each of them. So it might look a bit like this, that we list on the x-axis all possible outcomes, 
and on the y-axis the probability that that outcome will occur. And that would be our statistical model of the uncertainty about the temperature in Wageningen uh, 1st of August 2020. Okay, so that's, that's what we're going to do. That's the kind of approach that we are taking. So what we need to represent uncertainty in a, some variable is a probability distribution function. So I, I call that PDF, probability distribution function. Um, yeah, well, usually uh, it's w when we, for temperature, rounded to an integer, it would be a discrete probability distribution function. But if we're dealing with a continuous variable like the soil pH, soil organic carbon, well then it, it will be a continuous distribution and I think we're all familiar with that the normal distribution is often used. There's also a reason for that because there's this uh, so-called central limit theorem from statistics which tells that things, when you average things, they tend to become, go to the normal distribution. So let's say uh, that we use this normal distribution to represent a variable that we do not know exactly, right? Because there is a list of possible outcomes on the x-axis and on the y-axis we have the probability, or I should better say the probability density in this case, because it's a continuous variable. Uh, although, of course, in, in, in the earth sciences we also come across often variables that are not normally distributed, they look more like a log normal distribution, they have a very skew type of distribution. Uh, like, for example, the concentration of heavy metals in the soil. I, on Monday we came across that a little bit. We assumed a bit of the normal distribution, but the histograms showed that it was a bit skew. And, and these kind of log normal distributions, that, that is what you get. You can show that also statistically when you not add, you don't take averages of multiple uh, random sources, but when you multiply them. Okay, so this could be uh, a representation of the uncertainty. Here we also have this really common normal distribution and it would, if we would assume a normal distribution, we could also assume other distributions. I mean, the uniform, exponential. You parametrize the probability distribution that, that characterizes the uncertainty. For the normal distribution, well, this is the mathematical equation. Maybe you came across it already once and maybe you also remember that for the normal distribution, well, yeah, the, it has two important parameters, the mu, m the mean, the center of the distribution, and the sigma, the standard deviation, which is a measure of the spread. Okay, so the sigma really characterizes the uncertainty. If you have to summarize uncertainty in one number, you would probably use this sigma, the standard deviation of that uh, probability distribution. But it doesn't mean, if, if uh, sometimes we, we might write, mu plus or minus sigma doesn't mean that values bigger than mu plus sigma or smaller than mu minus sigma cannot occur. Actually, uh, for the normal distribution, it happens one out of three times that uh, the value is bigger than one sigma from the mean, right? And maybe also 95% of the time it is within two sigma from the mean. And 99.7% out of a hundred times it is within plus or minus three sigma of the mean. So that's, these are these characteristics of the, of the normal distribution. Okay, so what did we talk about? There is error, for example, if we predict the pH at some location, we make a prediction, but that prediction will differ from the reality. There will be an error. The problem is we usually do not know the error. We are uncertain about the pH, but perhaps we are able to characterize our uncertainty with a probability distribution. So the error of our estimate of the pH would be a probability distribution. And, uh, well, centered around zero, that is actually what we safeguarded. Uh, we ensured on Monday by using this unbiasedness, I already mentioned that, the sum of the Krieging weights must be one, so we made sure that this would be the probability distribution of true minus predicted, but there is an error, there is an uncertainty, so perhaps the true value is bigger than the predicted value, we, we would be end up somewhere over here. Perhaps the true value, which we do not know, is smaller than the predicted value, we would end up somewhere over here, right? 
On average, we get it right, but at any location, at any case, we might have an by accident, we might be uh, overestimating or underestimating. On average, it's zero, but every particular case, we, we make an error, and that error is characterized by a probability distribution. I think we also on Monday, we looked, uh, I asked you, what do you prefer? Uh, we had also this one, right? Uh, it doesn't fit now. Or, or perhaps this one. I, I draw them like this because you know, maybe also you remember from your statistics classes that the surface area below a probability distribution must always equal one, uh, like 100%, right? So if I make it narrower, the top must be higher. If I make it wider, the top must be lower because the surface area below must be one. And I think we had uh, something like this on the, on the whiteboard on Monday and I asked you which one do you prefer? <laughs> Yeah, that is when we derived how to compute these Krieging weights. Uh, you like to have it as narrow as possible, this probability distribution, because it would measure, it would mean that the errors are usually quite small, and that's what we like. So green is better than blue is better than red. And that's what we aim for when we do the Krieging. We make the best prediction possible with the smallest standard deviation of the prediction error. But we cannot accomplish that it actually becomes zero. We can make it as small as possible, given the data that we have, given the spatial variability, and then we quantify it with this Krieging standard deviation. And uh, that is, like, like I said, if you have to summarize uncertainty with one number, you would probably use this standard deviation. Okay, so I'm, I'm sort of repeating a little bit what, what we discussed already on, on Monday. This is about a single number. Now let's see how can we extend it to spatial uncertainty. Well, when we extend the uncertainty concept, the, the, the way that we de characterize uncertainty with a probability distribution, but we want to make it really spatial, well, for example, for this Geul study area, it means that we have to come up with this probability distribution at every geographic coordinate. So I took uh, just two of them over here, location here and location here, and for each of these two locations we will have a probability distribution. But it's not enough, okay? So we can, <laughs> this is the first thing we need to do, we need to know the probability distributions for each and every location in the study area, but the problem is there will also be spatial correlations in the errors. So, and then you move to what they call a, a, a multivariate probability distribution. So I did that here for just for a bivariate, huh? the value over here and the value <laughs> or the error over here and the error over here, they may be correlated with one another. And uh, the correlation between the errors over here is not characterized by these two, what they call marginal univariate probability distributions. So if you just specify the uncertainty eh, by means of a probability distribution for each and every location, you still haven't fully captured the spatial uncertainty because you also need to characterize the correlations between the errors. Uh, if I, well, these two locations are quite far apart. Maybe the correlation will be really small, but if they would be close to one another, if I would over predict my error would be too high, the true value, uh, well, the prediction would be bigger than the true value at, at this location, then it's not unlikely that I make the same kind of error over here. So they will be positively correlated. You need to characterize that as well. So you need to characterize the full multi multivariate probability distribution. Okay, let's see. And Krieging gives us all that, in fact, because the semivariogram that we talked about on Monday, it characterizes the spatial variation. It helped us to derive the Krieging weights. It helped us to derive the Krieging standard deviation, but it also contains information about the spatial correlation between the Krieging errors. And it's not identical to the semivariogram, so don't take that as don't take, make that mistake. But it is characterized. You can derive it from the semivariogram. 
So the geostatistics allows us to characterize uncertainty in spatially distributed variables. F a full statistical model. <coughs> okay, um, yeah, I showed you, well, I showed you uh, this, this confidence interval. I, I introduced it also that in the global soil map.net project, we like to quantify uncertainty with the lower and upper limit of the 90% prediction interval. So it's again, it's just this probability distribution. Uh, you identify the two points that there's 5% probability being smaller than this value, 5% probability bigger than this, and then this would be the lower and the upper limit, and then you're 90% certain that the true value is within these two limits. And I don't know, I don't think you made this map, you were not asked to make this map on Monday, but you could have, right? You could have uh, you had your Krieging prediction map of the lead concentration of the soil. You could have, and you, you had calculated Krieging prediction, you had calculated Krieging standard deviation. Well, it's just something, you, you look it up in the, the, the table of the normal distribution. Of course, it's assuming that the uncertainty, the error in the Krieging prediction is normally distributed, but then you would find that I think for the 0 0.05 you have to do prediction minus 1.64 times sigma, that gives you here, a prediction plus 1.64 times sigma you get here. So these two maps are simply calculated from the Krieging prediction map and from the Krieging standard deviation map by, in this case, subtracting 1.64 times the standard deviation from the prediction and here adding. And I think this is a nice way of, of, of visualizing, communicating uncertainty. Uh, if, if an end user who has no statistical background whatsoever gets to see these three maps and you tell him, uh, well, uh, there's a 90% probability that the true lead concentration of the soil is in between these two values, then they have a pretty, pretty good idea about how accurate your map is. They also can tell that in this case the uncertainty is actually quite high, right? Because these maps are very, they have the same color legend. So it's black over here and it's blue over here. Well, there is quite a big difference. It's probably a better way of communicating uncertainty than presenting them with the Krieging prediction map and the Krieging standard deviation map. I think it works better to present them these two, the lower and the upper limit. Okay. Um, yeah, then the next thing, we did that on Monday in the computer practical, but I didn't explain you the theory, so that's what we want to do. And maybe after that we take a five minute really short break. Um, and this is about this spatial stochastic simulation. So we have characterize uncertainty with a probability distribution. If we make a map, we go for the center, eh, we go for the most likely value of the lead concentration of the soil. There is uncertainty about it. We can do plus or minus sigma, but we can also use a random number generator, throw the dice and sample from this probability distribution. Uh, there's the run, uh, one run algorithm, or in, in Excel you have a R A N D function. So, uh, of course, a random number generator in a computer is only what they call a pseudo random number generator because uh, the computer is a deterministic machine. Well, we can talk about that <laughs> a long time as well, but I don't think that's really necessary. Okay, so we somehow generate random numbers, sample randomly from that probability distribution. And you did that. On Monday, you generated uh, th these maps, for example, uh, but you, I we didn't explain how they were created. So it, it's useful to explain that now as well. So we'll address that in the next uh, few slides. So, but what do these represent? Well, they are at any location we have sampled from this probability distribution. So we might end up with a high value or a low value. Well, everything can occur. Of course, the probability, the frequency of certain values occurring is proportional to the probability density. So we often sample a value like this, but once in a while we sample a very high value or a very low value. So everything occurs 
proportional to the probability density. Uh, well, that seems like really easy. You just go to a grid cell, you sample from the probability distribution, you put that number there, and you go to the next grid cell, you sample again. But if you would do it that way, you would not preserve this spatial correlation structure of the error. So you cannot do it that way. You have to take into account that the errors that you have are spatially correlated. So you have to use a special technique that, for that, that, that sort of preserves, respects the spatial correlation structure of the errors. If you wouldn't do that, these maps would look much more noisy. I don't know if we can easily see that, but uh, there are, yeah, I mean, like in, in this corner over here, well, usually it's a bit like uh, orange, purple maybe, but it, well, in this realization it became pretty yellow, so high value of lead. But it was not an individual pixel, it was really like a cluster of pixels. So there is a spatial correlation. If the reality happens to be higher here than you would have expected based on the Krieging, then the neighboring pixels also are likely to be higher. There's a spatial correlation in the error as well. And you have to respect that when you create these simulations. Uh, another thing, maybe, we, why are we doing all this? Well, this is going to be really important for our uncertainty propagation analysis. So we'll talk about that uh, today as well. So these are like samples generated from, from the probability distribution, like throwing the dice. So how, how does it work? Uh, well, let's introduce first this stochastic spatial simulation. So what Krieging does, Krieging makes the best prediction that it, ca uh, that it can do, the most likely value. It's a, but it is only an estimate, it's only a prediction. The true value will differ from our estimate, usually. The real value, we don't know. Uh, we are uncertain about the true value. And that is why we... Yeah, mm, I didn't really make that explicit, but that is really at the heart of geostatistics, that you treat the reality as if it were the outcome of some kind of random mechanism. It's a stochastic process. It's a random variable. doesn't mean completely random, but there is stochasticity involved. We, we represent the reality, we model it as if it were the outcome of, uh, of a random process which has certain properties, like a mean, like a standard deviation, like a spatial correlation, and so on. So when we do this spatial stochastic simulation, we do not go for the best value, but we simulate from the probability distribution of the true value. Uh, we generate what, they call, what we call a possible reality. Okay. <laughs> um, I can also show it in a, in a little bit different way. And maybe that's useful. Uh, let's let's let me try to explain. Let that, let this be. A okay, yeah. <laughs> this is a transect across our study area, and so this is the geographic coordinate, and this is our target variable. And suppose. Um, that along that transect, let's say the pH of the soil behaves like this. I don't know. If we would measure at every location along that transect, we would find that the pH of the soil behaves like this. But of course, we do not know it. We only measured the pH at a few number of locations. So maybe we measured it over here, we measured it over here, over here, here, and well, let's say these are the measurement locations. That's where we measured the pH. That's where we know the pH. And we want to make a map. We do Krieging. We do a spatial interpolation. Well, when you do Krieging, you, you try to make the best prediction possible you go for the center of that probability distribution, so you get sort of a smooth... Okay, let's do like this. 
I, I will use black. I don't know what, what, what will actually happen. It also depends a little bit on the variogram, but it might look a bit like this. So the black line over here is our Krieging line. You also remember maybe from Monday that Krieging produces like a smooth version of reality. The reality is more erratic, but you don't know between these two points whether it went up or down. Hmm. You have to measure <laughs> in order to find out. So the best you can do is go for like for the average. So that's what Krieging will do and it perfectly makes sense because it, on average, it's, it's the best you can do. But there are errors, right? There is a difference between the black line and the green line. Now, uh, and we can quantify also the uncertainty with a Krieging standard deviation or compute from that this prediction interval, like the lower limit I don't know, may, might look a bit like this. And the upper limit. Okay, uh, I hope it's still clear. So the, 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 the dashed lines over here, they re represent our uncertainty by means of a prediction interval, the lower and the upper limit. So we believe, we, the, the geostatistics tells us that the true value will be within those two dashed lines in 90% of the cases. Oh, the green line, therefore, in fact. So what do we do when we do spatial stochastic simulation? We generate a possible reality. We sample from the probability distribution of the pH of the soil along this transect taking the information we have into account. We know that the true value at the measurement locations is given, but in between we do not know. So when we do spatial stochastic simulation, the result might look this, like this, I don't know where. <coughs> okay. This red line, or maybe this blue line. So we, we generate a possible reality, and we can generate an infinite number of those possible re realities. And our model, our idea of, <coughs> of the real world is that the, the true reality, the green line, is just one of those infinite number of realities that we could generate. It's just we don't know which one it is. Okay, that, that, that is what basically, so we generate a reality that could be the true one, but because of our uncertainty we don't know which of the many that we, the infinite number that we could generate is actually the true one. So that's what you do when you do spatial stochastic simulation. It's very different from Krieging. Krieging produces this black, smooth line. Stochastic simulation produces lines that have the same kind of spatial structure, the same kind of spatial pattern, the same degree of randomness as the reality. But if you compare how close does the blue or the red line uh, come to the green line, you will see that it is doing a worse job than the black line. Okay, so Krieging gives us really the closest prediction on average. And a spatial stochastic simulation uh, makes a worse prediction. So Krieging does the best job, but it is a smooth version of reality. Uh, if you would generate many, many, and you will be, uh, I don't know, maybe you will not be doing that in a practical, but you could. <laughs> if you would generate, maybe I asked you that already on Monday, I don't know if it was in the computer practical, but if you would generate many of these possible realities and you would take the average of all of them, what would you get? Prediction. Yeah, you get the Krieging line, the black line. So the average of these infinite number of possible realities is just the Krieging prediction. If you would calculate the spread, the standard deviation in all of these simulations, 
you would get the Krieging standard deviation. Okay, so that's the idea of spatial stochastic simulation. And indeed, on Monday I showed you these four possible realities. You remember, I had created them in this way, using this spatial stochastic simulation. So how can we do that ourselves? How does it work? Well, the idea, well, one, there are several techniques that allow you to, to generate these, these possible realities, but one of them is sequential Gaussian simulation, and it is used a lot, okay? It's a quite a nice technique. So the idea is you have your study area, you visit a location that you didn't have a measurement, okay? And you apply a Krieging algorithm to that location. So you predict, let's say again, the, the, well, let's say uh, the clay content of the soil at that location using the, the measurements that you have available. You get a Krieging prediction, you get a Krieging standard deviation. Normally, if our goal would be interpolation, we would substitute, we would use the Krieging prediction value. But when the goal is spatial stochastic simulation, you use a random number generator to sample from that Krieging probability distribution. So you don't take the center of the distribution, well, it's no longer here, but like here, but you take any value generated by sampling from the probability distribution. And what is very important is you assign the value that you measured to that location and you add it to your conditioning, to your data set. So you start out with maybe n observations, the number of observations you have in the study area, you visit the location, you sample from the Krieging conditional probability distribution at that location, and you add that simulated value to your data set. So at that point in time, you have n plus one observations. And then you move to the next grid cell, and you repeat the process. But the end of, at the end of that step, you also add the simulated value to your data set. So your data set becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, because every value that you had simulated before is added to the data set. And uh, be, by doing this, you preserve the spatial correlation structure. Like, uh, so if this, if this would be our study area and these are the locations, we would visit a location that we hadn't measured yet. Let's say we visit this location over here. We use a Krieging, using the observations in the neighborhood to make a prediction here. We get a Krieging distribution. We sample from this distribution. We add that simulated value to the data set. We go to a next location, maybe over here. And we creak again to this location, but the value that we had simulated here is going to be used when calculating the conditional, the Krieging distribution over here. So in that, and then we sample from that, and then we go to another location, well, maybe it's over here, and when sampling from the Krieging, doing the Krieging to this location, these two observations, well, they're not real observations, they are simulated values, but they are treated as if they were observations. And in that way, you can make sure that the spatial correlation structure is maintained. So that is really important. It also means this, that the, 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 the data set in grows and grows and grows as you gradually fill in your whole study area. That's why this stochastic simulation takes much more computing time than Krieging. You remember when you do the Krieging, you have to solve this linear system of equations, n plus 1 equations with n plus 1 unknowns. Well, in our computer practical on Monday, we, I think we had a grid of, uh, it was maybe 80 by 80. It's not, not a very pretty coarse grid, but it means 6,400 grid cells. And we started out with n is n equal 100. So in the end, we had almost 6,500 observations. The, for the final grid cell, we had 6,499 observations. And then Krieging using 6,499 observations is quite a, quite, a, quite a challenge. So that is why you had, 
Well, I, I'm, I'm a little bit drifting from the main topic, but in, in the GSTAT, in the Krieger function, you had this parameter n max. And I think it was set to 24 in the practical. And that was, well, well we were actually discussing this on Monday, that is the difference between this local Krieging and global Krieging, that you, when you set this n max in the GSTAT software, it means when you do the Krieging, only use the nearest 24 observations. If you would have not used this, then it would have taken several minutes to, to complete this uh, spatial stochastic simulation. Okay. Okay, almost ready and then we'll take a short break. Uh, these are also now, sort of in an animation mode, I show you possible realities of uh, uh, some f soil property generated using this spatial stochastic simulation. And, well, they are all different, right? Because they are, they, we use a random number generator to sample, and it, depending on the seed of a random number generator, we will get sample different values. But you also see that they are to some degree, they are similar. It's always red, orange over here. It's always blue, light blue, dark blue over here. And that is because of the conditioning data, right? We had, at some locations, we had measurements. And the measurements control the uncertainty. At, at the measurement locations, we know the true value. And because of spatial correlation, they also influence what are the likely values in the neighborhood of those observation locations. So if you look at the center of each circle over here, you will see that the color does not change. It's exactly what you see over here. And the green dots, if you, I hope you can all see that, these are the measurements. And when I generated these possible realities, the red line and the blue line, I made sure that they passed through those points because at those locations we know the soil property. It's just in between measurement <laughs> locations we don't know it. And if we are close to an observation location, well you remember from Monday I hope the Krieging standard deviation is small. So there's less uncertainty close to observation locations. If you are far away, let's say for example here where you're extrapolating, the uncertainty becomes much bigger. So I don't know if we, for example, go to a location where there should be little uncertainty over here. Well, here the, the differences between the colors shouldn't be too big because there's many observations nearby. So it should always be red, uh, orange. Whereas if we go over here, I don't know if it happens, but <laughs> that also depends on how many simulations. But in principle, also a little bit depending, of course, on the variogram. Uh, what is the range? What is the nugget? What is the sale? But here there should be more variation in the simulations than over here. Let's see, does it happen? Well, I see some blue, uh, yellow, green. Yeah. We could calculate the standard deviation of those simulations and then we would see that there's more variation here than here. If we had used enough simulations. Also here, uh, over there, it's quite some variation because that's where you're extrapolating. Eh? The Krieging standard deviation, you remember also in, in Finland we had a really large uncertainty because of that. Yes? Uh, here we are using true observation. Can we also bring in covariates to condition the... Oh, sure. You, this is ordinary Krieging case, let's say, but you can easily do this also for the regression Krieging case. Or the so where you have a geostatistical model which also uses information from covariates to, uh, to define the trend. Yeah, that's no problem at all. Yeah. Uh, what I did here was a little bit uh, a simplification in the case where, where we have a variogram with a zero nugget. So the variogram that I used here, um, the variogram looked like this. Well, you know, I if I would have used a variogram that looks like this, you know what would happen. We wouldn't say, see like a p complete noise map, right? <laughs> you remember that. 
I could also have used a variogram, let's say, that looks more like this. Then there would also be more noise here, right? Because you, you remember that from those possible realities that I showed on Monday. So neighboring pixels might already be quite different. There would be noise. And also in this graph, there would be like jumps just really close to an observation, the next location may already be quite different from what you had. So there would be jumps, but now it's like a continuous line through. So that's really the case where the variogram has a negative zero. So it a little bit depends on the variogram. Also, well, the, the degree of fluctuation that I had invented myself now, uh, that of course is also depending on, for example, the range of the variogram. And the sill of the variogram will dictate how big are the deviations. So that all is, of course, derived from the, characterized by the semivariogram. Yeah, I will take a break. Okay, so let's, let's continue. So what we did before the short break was we looked at uh, uncertainty, error, how can we model it statistically with probability distributions. We made the extension to spatial uncertainty. And we explain now, now we also understand how this spatial stochastic simulation works. The next step is we're going to, the final thing we wanted to do today is to look at uncertainty propagation in spatial analysis and modeling. So, uh, okay, uh, well, I already mentioned that this morning. So when we do our digital soil mapping, we produce soil maps. It's not just for the fun of it but it's because people want that map to be used as input to some kind of analysis or model. And here are some examples where, uh, well, it's not only soil information, but also other maps are being used in, 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 in spatial modeling. So you have input, which enters the environmental model and it produces output. And here are some examples, a uh, simple one, we can calculate from a digital elevation model the slope angle, we can calculate erosion risk from land use, slope, uh, soil type. So there's already some soil information coming in. Uh, soil acidification model or crop yields models, they need a lot of input as well. Uh, among others, soil properties. So these are the things we are mapping with, with our geostatistical tools. Uh, here's another graphical illustration of how lots of inputs, well, topography, uh, geomorphology, but also soil are being used and combined in various ways to calculate a suitability map to grow a certain crop. It's just an example. Uh, now, the uncertainty that are in these inputs to these models will propagate through the model. So the goal of this uncertainty propagation analysis is to calculate how uncertainty in the inputs to the model propagate to the output. And there are two important techniques that you can use for that. One is the Taylor series approximation method, but we're not going to discuss it now, but I did provide you with some literature. You remember I promised that, so you will find on the website or on the memory pin that you will get later this week, you will find some literature both for the Monday uh, module as well as for today's module. So for today's module there is actually, and, and also for the Monday module, I have put a reader of a geostatistics and uncertainty course that I give here at university. I put that reader also on the folder and that folder, uh, that uncertainty reader also addresses this Taylor series approximation method to analyze how uncertainty propagates. But for us today we will only look at what they call the Monte Carlo uncertainty propagation method. And they, those two techniques are sort of a little bit complementary. So uh, where the one is good, the other is worse, and whether the other is good and the other is worse, so you, if you have availability, use both, that really gives you uh, yeah, a good possibility to, to analyze uncertainty propagation in a very variety of circumstances. This, this Taylor series method is more analytical, more mathematical, it makes use of formulas, Whereas the Monte Carlo method, you will see it in a minute, is more numerical using simulations. And maybe the best way to, to introduce, to get an idea about how this works, maybe many of, some of you already came across it, it's really very simple, is, is to use an example. Uh, the example is about calculating the slope from elevation. 
So this is a, a digital elevation model of a part of the Alps in Austria. It's a small part, two by two and a half kilometers. And at every grid cell we know the elevation in, in meters. So it's a quite uh, mountainous area. Well, we can easily calculate the slope of that uh, area by uh, running a, a, a three by three window or whatever GIS button we press to get the slope. Now, suppose there is an error, there's uncertainty in our DEM. Well, we just learned that the way we can represent that is using this spatial stochastic simulation. So we are uncertain about the true elevation at every grid cell. The true elevation is actually, in our modeling approach, represented by a probability distribution. It will have a certain width, uncertainty. Well, in the previous slide, let's say that the standard deviation is plus or minus 10 meters. And I sample from that probability distribution. So at every location, I generate possible realities. That's what you need for this Monte Carlo method. Because what does the Monte Carlo method do? It, for each of these possible realities that could be the true one, we just don't know which one is the true elevation, it runs the model, it calculates the slope. So these are all the slope maps that correspond with the elevation map, the, 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 the simulated elevation maps. So the Monte Carlo method simply samples from the probability distribution of the uncertain inputs and runs the model for each of those inputs and, uh, well, stores the result. Maybe it summarizes it, for example, at each location. The, here are three example locations. You can make a histogram of all the generated slope values. And maybe we could uh, calculate the mean or maybe the standard deviation again of those slope values as a single measure of the uncertainty. So it's a really simple approach. It's very uh, intuitively clear that the way Monte Carlo analyzes how uncertainty propagates is by m doing simulations. And uh, here I put uh, how, how, uh, how it basically works. So you repeat many times, uh, capital N times. I put here uh, at least 100. But in some cases, and um, I'm not sure if I have a slide on that, but you can analyze also how many Monte Carlo runs are needed to get accurate, stable results. But usually you need quite a lot. And maybe in some cases, 100 may not even be enough. Maybe you need 1,000. Also a little bit depending on what you want to know. So you repeat many times. You simulate a realization. You generate a realization using uh, this pseudo-random number generator from the probability distribution of all the uncertain inputs. And you can also have multiple uncertain inputs, right? maybe not only one soil property, but multiple soil properties or other inputs to your model. You generate possible realities and you run the model with these simulated inputs and you store the result. And after you've done that many, many times, you, you analyze those N model outputs you, by computing, for example, summary statistics like the mean, and the standard deviation. And of course, that standard deviation will be a measure. If you have to summarize uncertainty in one single measure, then the standard deviation is probably the most logical choice. So that, that's the idea of Monte Carlo simulation. It's really pretty simple. Uh, and now I'm going to introduce what you will do in the computer practical.